Good afternoon, everyone, and a, a thank you to uh, Commissioner Franz and his team. Uh, always grateful and uh, appreciate the, the level of detail uh, for all of us and for Minnesotans to understand uh, where we stand and budgetary. Uh, I want to begin, though, by recognizing the incredible legacy of Governor Mark Dayton. I'm humbled to follow in his footsteps. We pledge to continue his legacy of fiscal stability. We will develop a budget that maintains fiscal responsibility while protecting the reserves. This forecast shows a strong foundation from which to build our one Minnesota. Earlier this week, Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan and myself finished a uh, pretty extensive listening tour of, uh, of all of Minnesota, ranging from North Minneapolis to Laverne to Halleck to Winona, um, St. Cloud, and everywhere in between. And it was absolutely clear in those listening sessions, Minnesotans are hungry for government that puts uh, people before politics and invests in a future that gives every child an opportunity. I heard from a grandmother in La Crescent who talked about the need to make sure that education funding makes sure that the opportunities her grandchild has in Woodbury are the same that her grandchild has in La Crescent. A leader in Fergus Falls who talked about the reduction of local government aid that forces impossible solu or, uh, solutions that they're forced to make that make them choose between public safety and basic water infrastructure. A young mother in Halleck who really struggled and wanted too badly to move back home, uh, but the lack of housing in the area made that difficult. And a father in St. Cloud who told the Lieutenant Governor-elect that he was forced to choose between providing his family with healthy food options or affording his health care premiums. It's clear, being out there, it's clear to anyone who's listening, Minnesotans are ready to find common ground, tackle the challenges in their communities, and build their life for every single one of us. Our budget will reflect the priorities of the people of Minnesota and build for future generations. Under our leadership, Minnesota will become the education state. We will ensure every child, no matter their race or their zip code, receives a high quality education. We will increase access to affordable quality health care. Minnesotans have made it clear that they believe health care is a right and not a privilege, and we will push policies that reflect this value. We will revitalize our communities. As we traveled across this state, we heard Minnesotans talk about the need to ensure their communities aren't just surviving, but that they're thriving. From pushing for increased support to local communities and local government aid, to investing in infrastructure and working to provide every family access to childcare and ad adequate housing, we will ensure prosperous communities thrive across Minnesota. I look forward to working with the legislator, legislature to further those priorities. Together, we can make a one Minnesota a reality, an incredible place to live, to work, to play. The Minnesota that we love is there. The strong foundation that Governor Dayton and his team have left for us on the hard work and investments in ingenuity that Minnesotans have done to create the place where we're at now is an opportunity to step for the next generation to invest in those things that allow us to be prosperous and live the lives we want to. Um, and that's exactly what we intend to do. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Does this workout take tax increases off the table? Well, first of all, I, I think you're going to hear from some folks on this is to be very clear. Uh, some of the concerns that I've always had is these do not factor in inflation. They do not factor in some of the changes that come with a volatile economy. And they do not factor in, in many of these things of when people talk about they invest in one-time money. When we're talking about investments in education and healthcare and infrastructure, we are talking about generational investments. So the, the conversation I had and that Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan had during this entire campaign was honest discussions about what Minnesotans want to see out of their government and in their state, what it takes to put those policies in place, and how do we ensure that they're stable through good times and bad. So at this point, we're still formulating. This budget is, uh, is new to us over the last several hours, and we'll continue to work to formulate those. So they're not off the table, is what you're saying? I think it's irresponsible in any time to look at something without understanding what we're trying to get to, how we're trying to build that, and continue to, uh, to assess where that'll be. With regard to the gas tax, specifically, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka says now is not the time to talk about it. What do you say? Well, he obviously hasn't driven west on 94 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> I would say, or <laughs> Highway 14. Uh, that's not going away. One-time funding's not going to address this. Uh, I would say, again, uh, we are not laying down uh, 
red lines in the sand. Uh, what we're saying is, is that Minnesotans were very clear throughout this tour that infrastructure and infrastructure investment was a major priority for them. Long-term investments are going to have to make that happen. And we'll start to talk about how do they expect to make that happen? Because uh, again, we've seen this before, uh, but Highway 14 is still two lane at Claremont. It's still one of the most dangerous highways in Minnesota. Uh, same thing we're hearing in every place we've been. said there's room for tax cuts in this or tax relief. Would you be open to that? Well, what I would say on this is, is if we've followed those policies before and that gave, when Governor Dayton came in with a $6.2 billion deficit, we saw structural imbalances that threatened our schools and threatened the prosperity of the future. Uh, at this point in time, we will uh, continue to move in a direction that brings long-term stability, that balances budgets, that keeps the reserve strong and addresses those shortcomings that we have. So we have not, uh, again, had the ability to uh, to craft a budget that, that looks into those. So we're... Uh, I think uh, when your talking point when your talking point is the same, when, when has there ever not been a time where former speaker hasn't said that? I, I'm sure that's pretty common. It's kind of a surplus, 1.5 billion. Does it influence what you want to do with the health provider tax, which looks stable for a year or so, but then looks like a billion dollar deficit on that? Yeah, just, just to be clear, and, and looking at this number, if you will, the, the $1.5 billion, again, because of the hard work of Minnesotans, Governor Dayton's legacy, but should the health, uh, the provider piece of this not be renewed at the sunset in 2019, and not counting, and that's, that's almost $1 billion, 950 some and inflation estimated to be 2.3% next year, that's $1.2 billion right there that would come out of the general fund. So all of a sudden, overnight, if that expires, we've gone from one5 down to $300 million. And so this long-term access for Minnesotans to high-quality, affordable, accessible health care through an incredible program like Minnesota Care needs to be preserved, and that is a discussion we'll have. Matter in 2019 in this next Yes, I consider it a priority. I talked about it extensively on the campaign trail. I made it very clear that that access fund was, was critical, and I will remind folks that a month ago, a historic number of Minnesotans apparently agreed with that when they cast a vote. said state has debt capacity of three billion dollars and we are not looking at a normal budget year or a bonding year excuse me but uh, what would you like to do with that debt capacity yeah well just because we have that debt capacity doesn't certainly mean we spend at that level but it does mean i think and, and i think we're open to to talking about bonding this year but again i'll come back to those those guiding principles that i opened with is is fiscal stability and the protection of the uh the surplus, the rainy day fund is, is critical. But I think that that is certainly a, a point to look at. Republicans said that uh, when it comes to road and bridge highway improvements, one-time revenues is exactly the, a good source for one-time spending for physical infrastructure uh, improvements. And thus, the gas tax is not a way to go. How, how do you respond to that argument? Well, that's... Again, I would argue philosophically the way the looking at the world is, that's not looking to long-term needs, long-term changes as we move to autonomous vehicles, uh, whether they be uh, hybrids, plug-ins, uh, whether we look at multimodal, how all of that will fit into this. That, that is a short-term approach to a, to a situation we should be envisioning what Minnesota's transportation infrastructure looks like in 2040, uh, not in 2020. And I, I certainly uh, think there are many ways, and there's different funding mechanisms. Um, but once again, we got to this situation by limping along, now having a C minus rated transportation system in this state, a state that vests 27th out of the 50th states in investments in infrastructure, and it doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a fiscally sound nor a, a particularly wise policy when you can't build in predictability, stability, and that long-range plan. This is the type of infrastructure investment and planning that should extend beyond administrations uh, to get this right, other than we have a little extra money, let's, let's decongest 94 for right now. Uh, that's that's not the way to approach these issues. 
broadband legislative leaders express some interest in that? Is that the kind of thing you should deliver? Uh, why not getting into granular sure? details? I certainly think those those make sense to explore, that those are things that you can catch up and, and make differences. Are there other investments that you can deliver in this one Minnesota to rural Minnesota and greater Minnesota in particular, now looking at this number? Well, again, and we are, uh, we're in the process of, of course, putting this team together. We're in the process of listening to Minnesotans. I love the old... Uh, Abraham Lincoln advice to us. He was told if he had six hours to cut down a large tree, he'd spend four hours sharpening the ax. Uh, we're sharpening the ax as we speak, and I think gathering those in and looking holistically at the budget, that does make sense. Things that do make more sense where you can get ahead, excuse me, and you can invest uh, in a way that is not just trying to, uh, to fill a gap for a short term, uh, like transportation is much broader. So there are those. And we'll cuts just to be clear because the Republicans specifically mentioned lowering income tax across all the brackets and then a child care tax credit to be clear you don't like either of those ideas. Well, I didn't say we take anything off there I think the thing is is that they made a, a world view during a gubernatorial campaign that uh, accepted our way of looking at this and, and again I have been much clearer uh, you have not heard red lines in the sand from me you've heard a vision of what it's going to take to get to outcomes to have the best educated healthiest workforce with prosperous communities based around things that will provide child care that will provide uh, clean drinking water all of those pieces so when we get to the point where we will uh, certainly be open to discuss to discuss everything it's a better way to negotiate I'm not I'm not going to negotiate with myself right now, but um, that's what we can do. You've also traveled the state just a little bit the last few months. Tell us where you've seen problems in the economy and where what you might be able to do as state government to help them. Yeah, and, and there's certain things. It's a good question in, in that certainly as a southern Minnesotan where agriculture dominates, uh, there's, there's great uncertainty from commodity prices to tariffs, trade policy, uh, unfinished farm bill. Uh, I think there's a softening there and a concern. Uh, but I think it's greater, and Lieutenant Governor-elect uh, maybe will have a point on this, that especially in greater Minnesota, the, uh, the fragileness of lack of, for example, daycare providers really puts a strain on the economy from people just not those already living there and struggling to try and provide this, but folks who think about moving there to live that quality of life, they're being hampered from it. So I, I do think that. And then I'll go ahead and, and continue to reiterate this, that... Uh, that a strong, robust, healthy transportation system not only moves people safely, it is a catalyst to moving goods and ideas. And then back to the question on broadband, that we have expansion of businesses. And in Halleck, for example, at the distillery, um, it's, a, it's a spot where people go. It's people like to get uh, far north spirits. They want to get up there. But 99.9% .9 of their product is sold elsewhere. And they made a really interesting point on that, is that they're very concerned about transportation infrastructure in the Twin Cities where their clients live and want them to be able to move. So uh, I think it's just that connectedness. It's the sense of making sure those foundational pieces for a strong economy are there. And then it even goes deeper than that when this issue that the grandmother in La Crescent brought up is if we're creating an education system of the haves and have nots where we've predicated it on property tax and areas that don't have that property tax base as high as others is creating a worker shortage and a skilled workforce. And, and again, that workforce issue and uh, having enough bodies that, that, are, that are able to do the jobs uh, is starting to have a pull on the economy, as I'm sure you heard the commissioner mention. And inflation formally back into the forecast, especially now that it's projected to be ticking up. Well, I've, I've said all along, I've made it no secret, that yes, I believe that I think it's important. I think it's part of uh, honest, fair budgeting. Uh, I think it gives us a much better picture because I hope all of you, and I think uh, Commissioner Franz did a really nice job of explaining this, uh, if you just report this as the 1.5 uh, billion without taking into account 2.3% inflation that's projected out to the 2023 biennium, um, you're going to miss what that's happened. And, and I can tell you the, the effect of this that it happened in education funding is in the St. Paul district, just the erosion of keeping pace with inflation, even if you're putting new money in, eroded a little over $600 per pupil in funding, which is catastrophic in terms of programming and, and everything else. That coupled in a 
rural community with a low tax base is what equates into rising property taxes. So I, I will want to have this discussion. Certainly, uh, I think it's one that you can't get a true picture of what your investments or your future looks like without having those inflationary measures in there. So I want to thank you all. Look forward to it. And um, really pleased to say this is being turned over to uh, Speaker Designee Hortman. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we are a big team here, so. It's definitely a positive budget forecast going into the next two years, but there are significant cautionary notes. And I think um, for folks in the media, as a lawyer, I'm empathetic that we're not necessarily any of us known for our math skills, so I did the math for everybody. But with a 1.544 positive balance, but 1.162 billion in inflation that's not taken into account in this forecast, we have a real surplus of 382 million and not all of that ongoing. So just uh, looking forward, we also have to take into account there's some significant trade uncertainty with the president's trade war with China and how that could in fact uh, affect Minnesotans in our soybean markets and in our pork markets in particular. In the out biennium, this forecast has a deficit of $2.41 billion. So it's not um, a, a, a forecast that allows us to go into session and talk about a lot of new spending and tax cuts. That would not be fiscally responsible. We all also know, because we've listened to Myron Franz for a long time, that we are closer to our next recession than we are far from the last one. And we have to be cautious as policymakers to ensure that we leave the state in good fiscal order, not only through this next biennium, but as we head to potentially tougher waters in the future. So I would say it's a positive budget forecast, but there's two important cautionary notes, and those are number one, inflation, and number two, uncertainty going forward. Um, just a couple of uh, quick comments. Uh, I'm the uh, incoming uh, chair of the Ways and Means Committee, for those of you that may not know that. But uh, a couple of points that uh, I wanted to make uh, relative to the commissioner's presentation, and that was the tight labor market. I think we're, uh, we're um, underestimating what the needs are there. And uh, it's not only the numbers in terms of how tight that labor market is, but there are certain occupations that are very high need. And uh, it's going to be important for us to work in the future with the business community, with the higher education community, and the education community generally to begin to address uh, that need. Otherwise, that will compound uh, some of the problems we see when we're looking at things uh, long term. Um, the uh, cautionary note that uh, was just uh, mentioned, uh, those projections do show that there's going to be a slowing of the economy. And I think it's important that we look at things uh, long term, as the, uh, the governor pointed out. And one other comment, and then I'll turn it over to others. I do drive 94 and 394 every day. And so transportation has to be a major issue in the upcoming legislative session. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Winkler. I'm the incoming majority leader in the House. The uh, presentation from MMB also highlighted the fact that lower health care expenditures were a big factor in the uh, budget surplus that's projected. And health care, as uh, we've all seen from the campaign trail and the governor-elect talked about this, health care is driving so much insecurity in family budgets, and it creates a lot of volatility and a lot of long-term uh, un instability in the state, uh, the state budget as well. So uh, one of the top priorities for the legislature and the governor have to be dealing with rising health care costs, which are eating away at family economic security. And while we start with a, a healthy state budget at this point in time, in the long run, health care is going to be a major driver uh, challenging uh, our ability to invest in education and transportation and everything else. And so addressing that early and aggressively will be an important part of the next uh, session's priorities. So Lynn introduced himself as the incoming chair and the, and the previous chair of Ways and Means, and I continue to be the ranking minority member of the Finance Committee, what, whatever that means. Um, and congratulations to Melissa, Ryan, and Lynn on a spectacular election and what is going to be a great session for them. So I have a couple of comments. Uh, the last couple of years on the Senate floor, I think I've been viewed as Cassandra 
and so I'll continue that. Um, certainly there's some room in this budget for um, a lot of what the governor would like to do. Uh, there is some maneuvering room with some very uh, good budgeting uh, uh, folks uh, on the governor's staff, the governor, the lieutenant governor, uh, the folks at MMB. But I said a couple of things, and, and it's proven to be, to be true. I expressed concern uh, after the two, at the end of the two, 2017 session that the tax bill we passed was not sustainable. And with $800 million, or almost $800 million budgeted for that now, uh, that's the situation. Um, last year, I talked about the one-time spending for ongoing purposes that, was, that were placed in, in uh, various bills so that we had uh, $70 million, I think, with uh, Metro uh, Transit that was budgeted as one-time spending. It's not one-time spending. We have part of the school readiness program of $50 million that was budgeted as one-time money. There was a smaller appropriation for vocational rehabilitation, and we took money out of the budget reserve uh, for the premium program of, I think, approximately $200, $220 million. Now, there's some different ways to budget with that, uh, for instance, with uh, what we do with uh, some of the uh, premium program, there's no reason why we can't look at insurance reserves, for instance, and not take that out of the general fund. But it's going to take some, some strong budgeting to do some of that. Um, and that's coupled with our, the discussion we had on the Senate floor both uh, last year and uh, or this year and, and last year that the economy was going to slow down. That some of the storm clouds that uh, have been discussed today were quite visible, or certainly somewhat visible over the last year and a half. And you look at that combination, and it's going to be uh, really some difficulties. Uh, Speaker Designate uh, talked about that. And I think in reporting that you do, it, it, there has to be an emphasis that uh, there are some storm clouds. And they're not just something in the distance. It's something that's going to hit us in, in this year's budgeting. So I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to do some of the, the things that absolutely need to be done for the state. I think we can do some of those things that need to be done but uh, we're going to have to work very hard to make sure that uh, there's a budget, as the governor has emphasized, is a stable budget. Uh, it's a budget that d doesn't take money from the budget reserve anymore because we'll need that budget reserve in the future. Um, and I uh, would also mention, of course, as uh, I think uh, Representative Winkler has mentioned, as Representative Hortman has mentioned, that uh, we have the problem, as the governor emphasized, the health care access fund. Uh, we have to do something about that uh, uh, that sunset and, and get rid of it because otherwise health care funding is going to fall off the cliff uh, in the very near future. So on those optimistic notes. Well, thank you. I um, continue to be the uh, uh, Democratic lead on, uh, uh, on the uh, Senate Tax Committee. And uh, I would uh, just reemphasize that unpredictability, volatility um, uh, are... Uh, the watchwords, not only on the spending side, but also on how we approach tax policy. Um, we are, we've heard a lot about uh, tax conformity. We've been encouraged by tax professionals um, uh, throughout the state to go slow, to make sure that when we, uh, when we come up with a tax bill, that it uh, respects the uh, Minnesota system that we have now, that's what's in this uh, forecast. The forecast says we are going forward this year with this coming year at least with, a, um, with an understanding of Minnesota's tax system as it is now. And that's the kind of caution that we are getting from uh, taxpayers and taxpayer representatives, and we want to uh, continue to do that. Uh, this $1.5 billion budgetary um, balance, as many have said, is certainly a, um, uh, it's a good start for us. But we need to be very, very cautious, again, about thinking that it can be used for ongoing commitments, for ongoing investments in uh, education, in health care, uh, in transportation. Uh, half of the money, if you will, uh, is really one time, is available for one time spending and one time spending only, or one time investment, whatever word you'd like to use there. And so whether it's broadband, whether it's transportation, whether, as a matter of fact, 
Um, it is affordable housing. And affordable housing is not just something at the urban core. Affordable housing plagues uh, greater Minnesota as well. And what we need to go do going forward is making sure that we have a responsible conversation about what those investments will be, that we respect inflation, that we do not overcommit in any area, and that we um, bring the benefits that we possibly can to uh, Minnesota families, Minnesota taxpayers. So uh, caution against unpredictability and volatility, uh, making sure that we understand the, um, the uh, ability of the federal government to have an impact on what goes on in Minnesota. We know that Minnesota is not um, immune to what is happening at the federal government. Governor-elect Walls talked about um, the impact on soybean farmers, uh, the trade policy there, and we need to be paying attention to that. So the caution is looking for stability, uh, looking for predictability um, in the face of a lot of uncertainty uh, coming from any number of, of quarters, the global economy as well as, um, um, as federal uh, tax and investment policies. So I think, um, uh, Speaker-elect Horton, maybe you want to take some questions. Or unless I'll be very short. Uh, my name is Carrie Dietzik, and I'm the lead on ag and housing. And I just echo what my colleagues up here have said. I think this uh, budgetary balance gives us an opportunity to, while we need to be cautious, it also gives us an opportunity to continue conversations to make sure we can do some strategic investments that help seniors, students, our working families, and farmers. So with that, I will turn it over to questions and speak with Foreman. Republicans made it very clear they think the gas tax should be off the table. What is your thought on that? Well, Governor-elect Walls definitely ran on that. He had a conversation with Minnesotans about that topic, and he believes it's a mandate of his election, and it is a fair discussion for us to have. What the Republicans uh, omit to mention is that one-time money does not help you maintain a road. It doesn't do you any good to build a road if you don't then maintain it. And so it's not uh, one of those things where we can just set aside some one-time money and think we've fixed a problem. We have ongoing needs in the system that a small amount of one-time money wouldn't fix. We spend $4.5 billion every biennium on our road infrastructure. So when you see a one-time surplus of $382 million and you put that into the context of $4.2 billion in biennial sp spending and that being a shortfall, you know, under what we need, $382 million doesn't really start to fill that hole. And it ignores all of the other needs of the state. Gas tax, the only thing still on the table. They were saying all tax increases off the table, including and especially gas tax. Well, I think that they're not reading all of the information that's been presented. I think it's really important um, that folks look at that $382 million number and how much of that $382 million surplus is actually ongoing before we think about what we're going to do in tax policy or education spending. Tax cut. Would that appeal to you? But as we talked about earlier this morning, there's a difference um, in, in conformity between what's urgent and what's important. It's definitely important that we do tax conformity, but it's not urgent. We've got uh, everything's all set for the filing for this year. We're certainly going to look at tax conformity, and there may be some cost to that. So we'll definitely have to take a look at that over the course of the session. The idea of heading off that sunset to the health care access fund as a tax increase. Is that a fair characterization? Well, I don't think so, but that's another issue where uh, Governor-elect Walls was very clear in his campaign on that, on that item, uh, that he's pretty committed to continuing the provider tax. We're certainly open to having that conversation in the House, and I don't need to explain to you how the legislature works. It'll be a four-month process for us to figure out what will be in the bills that end up going to um, Governor Walls' desk. But uh, we will have the conversation about whether or, what, or whether or not to allow that sunset to proceed. It's, it's going to be a tough sell, isn't it, to look at this forecast, whatever number you put in it, and say, we need to increase taxes, isn't it? To, partly depends on what you put in your headlines, whether it's $1.54 billion is a surplus, or if the headlines reflect the reality that 
uh, the Finance Commissioner talked about, which it, it is a budget balance of $1.54 billion. And we cannot ignore inflation. So it, I think the average Minnesota family, if they had an annual salary of $100,000, get a $5,000 raise, and go spend the whole thing on a trip to Jamaica, they might find that when they go to the grocery store to buy their milk, it's a little bit more expensive this year than it was last year. And maybe they should have budgeted some of that increase to handle inflation. Inflation is a fact of life, and we need to be prepared to deal with it in the budget. So people need to have restrained expectations about what we will be able to accomplish. We will invest in Minnesotans, and we will invest in Minnesota, and this positive forecast allows us to do that, but we have to do it in a responsible and sustainable way. I think it's very clear that uh, Governor Walls and our whole team ran on investing more in education and also making it uh, more secure for Minnesotans to find affordable health care coverage. Those, those would be our two, I would say, highest priorities. Spending, what are some of the ideas that you have heard about that you're going to tell people, come on, we, we can't go there? Well, I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot in the next several weeks. It's been about 30 days since we won the majority, and I'm sure we're just beginning to hear the proposals that will come forward. But there hasn't been a a small number that have come forward. Mouthful, isn't it? Yes, it's a mouthful. You have a very deft person to your right, and I'm wondering if you uh, are going to are you going to be considering are you going to be considering trying to apply pressure to senators that are in districts that you picked up seats in your budget uh, recommendations? You know, I don't think we need to think about it that way. I would just really ask everyone to think about how we govern in a way that's different than how we've talked about governing in the last four years. Over the last four years, we've talked about governing as though it's a game. And the objective is that one team scores points on the other team. I've had really good conversations with Senator Gazelka that we take off our red jerseys and our blue jerseys and we're here together as Team Minnesota to govern together. And so I don't think of it in the way that your question structures it. How do you budget and legislate with some of those dark clouds on the horizon as far as the economy? Cautiously. I think we're really fortunate that Governor Dayton took the fiscal stability of the state so seriously. It's not a really uh, sexy political issue. People don't generally reward you for being a good steward of the state's finances, especially on your way out the door. But I think we all owe him an incredible debt of gratitude. And uh, speaking of him, I suppose he's waiting to start his um, press availability until we're done. So thank you.